Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our study of the Gospel of Matthew, the Jewish Jesus. I'm John Walker, and along with others, I'm sitting with Bruce Wadsek, the minister of the Princeton Church of Christ. Bruce, where are we in our study of the Gospel of Matthew? Well, I'll open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. That's where we're going to pick up our study tonight. Uh, Matthew is suddenly kind of shifting if you will, subjects. Uh, in the first 12 chapters, Matthew has given us definitive proof that Jesus is more than a great teacher, a rabbi. He's more than a great prophet, like the prophets of old, and that he is truly the Christ or the Messianic king. Uh, and greater than the kings of old, like Solomon. And he has demonstrated this by his ability to teach the word, and more than that, to work miracles that no one, no one could duplicate. No one had done such things before him. And no one has done such things after him. Now, with that, you would think, here's Jesus. He's among the people of God, the people of Israel, these are the people that know the scriptures, that know who God is, who are waiting for the promised Messiah. Surely, as Jesus makes himself known, they're all going to get on board and say, here he is. Clearly, this is the promised Messiah. And I'm sure many of Jesus' disciples in the first century, up to this point in his ministry, are shocked that they're getting opposition from some of the Pharisees and the scribes, and that some of the synagogues are not receptive, uh, that even though the masses are amazed at what Jesus said, they're not amazed enough to decide to follow him and to implement the way of life that Jesus is teaching. And so I assume they're a lot like you and I are today. Uh, I think one of the things that... Uh, astonished me as a young preacher is I assumed as I ran into other religious people that were very devout religious people that believed the Bible was the word of God and were very pious people as far as I could tell. I just assumed these would be people would be very open if I was to share something with them, perhaps an insight in scripture they perhaps hadn't seen. They would very quickly say, oh wow, well the Bible teaches that. Uh, I appreciate you sharing that with me. I'm I'm, I'm eager to follow that. But instead, I found just like Jesus did his disciples, that sometimes the most religious people that I ran into were the least receptive if it was anything that they had not already come to believe was true. So if you offered any new insight, any new perspective, they were totally against it. They were didn't want to hear it, weren't interested, even were hostile. Uh, to you. Uh, for example, I think I told the story here a week or two ago about when we had a campus ministry in Denver and being called in before a bunch of deans and lawyers because we were evangelizing among some of the students. Well, what I didn't tell you was the reason we got there is because a couple of religious campus ministers who are not evangelizing anybody that had a couple of of students from their religious fellowship on campus, some of whom had decided to become disciples and part of our fellowship, they were the ones who were upset along with some parents and had called the administration and told them they should put a stop to this. So again, I found in my experience, uh, people that I thought would be uh, at least uh, on the same wavelength as I was, would be open to where I was coming from just the opposite uh, was true. And so Jesus, I think now, beginning in chapter 13, is going to begin to explain to his disciples and to the broader people listening um, why everybody uh, isn't receptive to the message of God. With that, let's turn to chapter 13. John, let's look at the first couple of verses. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat 
and sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. Bruce, where is this occurring? Yeah, I thought it'd be good to kind of get our orientation. We have alluded to this earlier, but I think it, you'll find this helpful. Um, Jesus located his Galilean ministry, which is what we've experienced thus far, uh, in the city of Capernaum, which was a seaside city on the north end of the Sea of Galilee. Let's look a little earlier at what we noticed uh, as we read through uh, Matthew. Let's look at a couple of passages just to kind of orient ourselves. Let's look first at uh, Matthew uh, chapter 4, verse 13. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. Yeah, so this is telling us early on in Jesus' ministry, he located himself in the city of Capernaum. Now, this gave him access. He could get on a boat and go to all kinds of parts of uh, various Judea and other places. So it was, it was kind of a convenient place to launch his ministry and to work out of. Now, even more than that, there was a house that, because it speaks of the home or house where Jesus was, we find a little later, in, as we were reading in our account, what house it was that Jesus centered his ministry out of. And that's, uh, we're looking now in Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, and then verse 14. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. Verse 14. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she rose and began to serve, serve him. So... It seems the place that Jesus is going to live and base his ministry out of in Capernaum is Peter's mother-in-law's house. Now, why is that significant? Well, I want to encourage you, you not necessarily do it right this moment, but go online and uh, put in Capernaum uh, first century and they'll take you back and look for the ones that has various images and you can see pictures of it. Um, Capernaum by the 20th century was, a, was, you know, no one was living there. There was no village there. They were able to excavate the entire site that made up ancient uh, Capernaum. And you can see that online. They have the ancient synagogue, the remnants of it. But what's interesting is right across the street, literally, from the synagogue was a house that when they began to excavate it, they found in the fourth century, a church had been built over this house. And then when they dug down deeper, they found that prior to a church being built there in the fourth century, there was a house church for Christian believers, Jewish Christian believers, going all the way back into the first century. And from that, they, uh, from the writing of the center, they deduced this was probably Peter's mother-in-law's house, located right by the synagogue where Jesus centered his ministry. And so we don't know absolutely that that's the case, but it makes good sense that uh, this was where Jesus centered his ministry. It's where there was a Christian house church after the time of Jesus, and eventually built a church on it. And today, of course, since it's uh, Peter's mother-in-law's house, the Catholic Church got excited about that, and they built a, uh, a church over the top of it. Now, the, today in Israel, they won't allow you to build right on it, so they had to build it up in the air. And you, you'll enjoy going to look at the picture. It looks like a looks like a flying saucer, or something sitting above the site. But it, it's a wonderful place. They have a sign at the beginning of it. They call it, uh, I got Jesus hometown. So uh, if you were to travel to Israel and to go on any kind of tour, they'll take you to Capernaum 
and you can walk those streets. But here's the nice thing. You could go online, look that up and look up the images and you can see all the pictures of the town yourself. So I'm just saying that to say, what did it say at the very beginning? Uh, he left the house. So prior to this, remember in the preceding verse, his mother and brothers were standing outside the house. And Jesus said, who is my mother and father? They're the ones that do the will of my father. Now he get up, gets up and leaves that house. Uh, but in doing so, he went down beside the sea. Um, and such a crowd gathered, it said, uh, he got into a boat and sat down. I, I don't know whether you've had any experience being around the water, but if you're around the water and talk, you can hear people a long way. The water causes your voice to echo kind of like a sound system. So Jesus, being very wise, knowing that a big crowd together and realizing if he stood on the land and talked, not everyone could hear. But if he got in a boat and put out just a little uh, out in the water, he would be able to magnify the volume of what he said and everyone could hear. So we see here Jesus, the master communicator. Now, also, I, I always found it interesting since he sat down. Now, if it had been me, I would have stood up, right? When I preach, I stand up. Not, not what preachers do, stand behind a podium or a lectern and, and speak. Well, that's not the case in a Jewish context. In a Jewish context, when a rabbi or anyone would seek to teach the Torah, he would sit down. And in a synagogue, they had a seat called Moses' seat. And that's the seat that a teacher would sit down in. So uh, Jesus is very Jewish in his approach. His audience is Jew. And so if he's going to teach, they expect him to sit down. And so he puts out in a boat and sits down and engages in the dialogue with them. So uh, as we uh, think about left, let's pick up in verse three and see what Jesus had to say in answering the question, why, why isn't everybody responding to the message of God? And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no death of soil. When the sun, <clears throat> But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Bruce, what are parables, and what is the agricultural reality of Palestine? Uh, interesting. Um, the Greek word parabole is the word, so through the Latin, that's where we get the word parable. Uh, in the Hebrew, is a mashal. And let's look at where that occurs. The mashal is broader term than what we think of. It includes parables, but it would also include what we would call wisdom sayings or, or proverbs. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, who was known for such teaching in the Old Testament uh, but the great king uh, Solomon? So let's uh, look back. In First uh, Kings 4, read verse 29 and following. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure, and breadth of mind like the sand on the seashore, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all other men, wiser than Ethan and Ezrahite and Heman, Kalkol and Darda, the son sons of Maal. And his fame was in all the surrounding nations. He also spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. When it says 3,000 proverbs, that's a translation of the Hebrew word mashal. So 3,000 wisdom sayings. That would be include anything of a parable down to what we think of as very brief uh, statements uh, in the proverbs. So... It's interesting, is it not, that 
the one known for such teaching was a king in Israel. It was King uh, Solomon, whom God gave special wisdom. And so Jesus is going to demonstrate the special wisdom that God has given him by teaching in parables. Well, what's a parable? Um, a parable is a very short story, uh, a, a picture image of something that teaches a deeper spiritual truth. Uh, in uh, Jewish thinking, uh, if you were just teaching uh, what the law was, that was called halakha. Halakha was teaching uh, the how to obey the law. Uh, on the other hand, if you were using illustrations of some time, they, they referred to that as haggadah. And that's what this would be, haggadah. And so parables as a way to illustrate uh, better who God is and what God expects us to do was a very common Jewish approach. Uh, when you go and read the Talmud and all the early Jewish rabbis, they all taught in parables. So Jesus teaching in parables was not like something totally un-Jewish that they wouldn't expect. It's just that Jesus's parables were more profound than uh, most of the rabbis' attempts at teaching the masses in parables. Um, in this particular uh, story, he talks about something that they all would be familiar with, and that is uh, harvest. There were two basic crops that were common in Palestine in the first century, wheat and barley. And what they would do in the early rains that would occur in late October, November, and into December would soften the soil up a little, and they would plant. Uh, their crops, and then hope for the heavier rains that would come in January and February uh, on into the spring when they would begin to harvest their crop. Now, like I said, not, not like us, where less than 1% of the American population is involved in agriculture. In other words, all the food we eat is produced by less than 1% of our population. Uh, in Jesus' day, uh, about 95% of people would be involved in agri. They'd either be the owners of the lands or the workers of the lands or uh, something related to it. And there'd be about 5% or so like Jesus was, which was a carpenter. And not really, that's probably not the best term for Jesus. We think of a carpenter as working in wood primarily. A tecton is what the Greek word was, that was a handyman who could work with wood. And the, the wood was not as common in first century Palestine. Mostly they worked in stone. So he would be a stonemason and could work with wood as well and other things to fix things and to build things. Uh, and so obviously people that were tectones, they would represent maybe 5% of the population. So merchants, et cetera would be people that were not directly involved in agriculture. So Jesus told his stories, many of his stories had to do with agriculture or things that grew because everybody had witnessed that over and over again. I can almost imagine knowing Jesus, he has not push the boat out from the water and he's talking and he may be lifting his hand up, pointing off to his left, because uh, I'm thinking we're, Capernaum is located, there were fields out to the left of Capernaum, and maybe there were people out in the fields sowing the seed at the very moment that Jesus is using this parable, or it had been very recently that people had witnessed this. So Jesus was talking about something they were very familiar with, let us say. Um, and then you talk about the different types of soil, especially in Galilee, you had, uh, uh, first of all, a lot of rocky soil because there's just a lot of mountains that grow throughout the Galilee. And so even if you get down on soil that's not just pure rock, there's some soil on it. Sometimes it appears that there's plenty of soil, but only maybe six inches or so below is hard rock. So if you were to plant seed there, 
what would happen is because uh, when sun would come down on it, it would actually germinate the seed early. Uh, it would go before those in deeper soil, but it would grow up, but, but because there wasn't room for the roots, the sun that brought it up early would burn it up and the plant, although it looks like it's good soil, it, it had rock under it. And then of course, in their day, uh, you marked off your fields by having paths that people are allowed to walk on. And, you know, when people walk on these paths enough, they're pretty hard. So as a guy is out sowing his field, he's not just putting one seed here and one seed there. He's sowing the seed like that. Some of it's going to fall on the pathway. Now, there's just no chance for this to penetrate into the soil. And the soil's hard by people walking on it. And so that's another thing they would be familiar with. And then, of course, you couldn't tell if, if somebody come in and try to remove the weeds, et cetera, from uh, an area. When you go out to sow it, you don't see any weeds there, but they may still be roots of those weeds down in the soil. And you won't discover that until the plant starts to come up and the weeds grow up along it and they tend to choke out the good seed. And all you have is the bad uh, various things that have grown up beside it. So again, this, these things, they would have all experienced in uh, seeing crops grow and perhaps they themselves sowing crops and discovering some soil wasn't as good as other soil. And then even when you had good soil, uh, it didn't produce the same amount. Uh, different soils produce different amounts. And so here he talked about three different levels, even some greater than others. When you talk about a hundredfold, that's a, a, a bountiful harvest from what we can tell. Uh, that was not the average harvest. And so uh, Jesus is saying, you know, from average harvest up to a bountiful harvest may come out of the good soil uh, because they produce different levels. Uh, so four soils, only one of those soils is good and produces a crop, but even it produces three different levels of fruitfulness. Uh, all good, but they diff produce different levels of fruit. And so Jesus is getting that out there and getting them thinking. And of course, the backdrop to this would be Jesus would be thinking again about Isaiah and probably this passage, Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So here Isaiah compares uh, God bringing the rains that allow the seed to grow and for uh, people to be fed. So with the word of God, he says the same thing. Uh, God's word is going to go out. It's not going to come back empty. It's going to be productive. Uh, and so this may be the very place. There are several places in the Old Testament where God refers to uh, the idea of him sowing his word among his people so that they could be uh, a fruitful. But Isaiah, I think, is especially important as we see Jesus will quote from that uh, in just a moment in this very context that we're in. Um, and the bottom line on all this is think how miraculous it is that this little tiny seed can be put into the ground and that given some time and water and sunshine, it produces a crop. You know, some seeds produce trees. This produces wheat, which here you had one seed, and at the end, you've got 20, 30, 100 seeds from this one seed. Now, that's miraculous. And that's, again, I think what Jesus was getting at when you think about how crops grow, and, and there's a, something very miraculous about that. So it is about the word of God. When it goes out into people's lives and hearts, 
what happens as a result of that it can be miraculous, life changing. Um, and so let's pick up where we left off uh, and look at verses 10 and 12 back in chapter 13. Then the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Bruce, why did Jesus teach the masses in parables? It's interesting, isn't it? Um, again, we have to keep in mind, these were Jews he was speaking to. These were people whose education involved memorizing the scriptures, memorizing the uh, oral law, how the rabbis interpreted all the law was to be applied. They were very familiar with the will of God. Uh, they were the people of God expecting a messianic king. Um, but just like a lot of people today who have a lot of head knowledge about the Bible and things, sometimes they don't have a practical knowledge. And uh, when Jesus taught in parables. Parables are stories. And, you know, people pay money to go to movies and to buy books that tell stories because we find these very entertaining and interesting. And of course, if these stories also teach us profound truth, then we have a double benefit. It's not just law, just here's the rules and here's how you follow it, but here's a story that helps you understand it we can recognize how if Jesus is teaching the masses, he would use parables because they were the easiest for people's attention to be focused on. And sometimes you could have the most profound uh, impact. For example, to uh, I'll give you an example of how in the past I did this, wouldn't do it the same way today because our culture is different. Back in the 1970s, uh, when local radio stations, rock stations, etc., were very popular and everybody listened and the, the tunes on them were very familiar, uh, uh, we uh, made a one-minute spot and we'd play just the beginning of a song's lyrics, just enough people to remember the song, then tune it in the background, and then I'd make a comment. Uh, about this, and I would have a spiritual truth that I would connect with this in just a very one minute spot. And then we'd say presented by uh, the church, you know, et cetera. And uh, we had a, we reached a lot of people through that because if I had taken the same one minute and quoted Bible uh, to the people, uh, people would not have listened. But because I'd took the medium itself, what people were listening for, the songs, and I talked about what the songs were talking about, and I got a spiritual message in that. For example, we gave a telephone number for them to call from these one-minute spots, and one month, uh, we got something like uh, 3,000 calls uh, that came in as a result of this one spot that was on uh, over a month's period of time. Why? Well, because we were speaking to people where they were. Uh, I wasn't just preaching at people. I was taking the medium. They were listening to radio. I was using it and taking my thoughts out of that and addressing uh, their situation. Um, my point is, that's Jesus, a master teacher. That's why he taught in parable, because he knew he could get the attention of the masses and he didn't want to just be a rabbi he wanted to be more than a rabbi to be able to communicate effectively uh, with the people uh, but as we noted here jesus tells them uh, it's been given to you you disciples to know the secrets are mysteries of the kingdom of heaven but to them it's not been given in other words the masses of people are not necessarily open to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. I've got to see if I can get their attention. 
I've got to see if I can make them think. I've got to see if I can get them to become seekers because if they don't, if they stay where they are, they're not seeking the kingdom of God. They're not seeking the rule of God in their lives. They may think they got all they need right now. I got all the religion I need. I don't, I don't need any more information uh, about religion. Well, Jesus wasn't coming and selling religion. He was selling life. And he was trying to capture the imagination and attention of his peers by what he did. And he used the term secret. We go back and look at the equivalent to secret or mystery. Uh, in the Old Testament, a secret or mystery was a uncovering and making known uh, of the will of God. Remember Daniel, uh, who was a captive in exile in Babylon, was uh, one whom God gave the ability to interpret dreams. And so the king had a dream, and it troubled him, king of Babylon. And so he called in his wise men and said, uh, normally I'll tell you my dream and you give me an interpretation, but to know that you're the real thing, I want you to tell me what my dream was and then what it means. Well, these <laughs> all the charlatans were going, well, we, we can't, nobody can do that. Nobody, only if God, the gods themselves revealed it. Could anybody know that? And so the king said, well, of what good are you? And so he gave orders to his military commander, kill all the wise men, kill all the people that claim to have all this wisdom, then run around interpreting things for me. I would just kill them all. Well, Daniel heard about this and came to the king and asked him to give him an opportunity. And, and then he went and sought God. And Daniel 2, verse 18 and 19, we read, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. So uh, a mystery is something that only God can reveal. God pulls back the page and says, this is, this is the meaning, this is what happened. Well, he revealed to Daniel what the dream was. The king had dreamed of an image, probably very much like an idol image, that had a head and a body on it, and thighs and feet. And it was made up of four different elements, gold and silver and bronze. And then the feet were a combination of uh, various kind of iron with some clay, which clay would, in the feet would make it weak. And then he had dreamed that uh, a rock broke loose from the mountain and rolled down and hit this statue and shattered it into pieces. And then this rock filled the whole picture and became a mountain itself. That was the dream. And of course, Daniel interpreted, you, O king, are the head of gold. You are have a great empire over the world uh, at this particular time. But he said, there will be uh, three others that follow you, and in the era of the last ones, God himself will establish a kingdom that will last forever. That's what the rock coming down. Well, who were these kingdoms? He was Babylonian. The Persians conquered the Babylonians, and then the Greeks conquered the Persians, and then the Romans conquered the Greeks. And during the time of the Romans, as Daniel predicted, as the king saw in his dream, God established his forever kingdom with Jesus, as Jesus is teaching his disciples here. So mystery is the same thing as a secret. And it's not like a mystery story. It's a, a big puzzle. It's something that men can't know unless God reveals it. That's what a mystery is. And so... That's what revelation and scripture is, God revealing what you can't know on your own. You can't know what God is up to and what's going to happen, but God can, and God can make it known. And so he says, it's not been given to the crowd yet to, to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but you have committed yourself to me 
So you're open to it. So I can explain it to you and you can learn those secrets. But you have to be in a certain mindset before you can learn that. Uh, I don't know if you ever had this experience, but um, a few times when I was in college, I went early to the class and it was uh, a different class was in session. I remember I was stepped into some science classes and they were just before my class. And I, my mind, my eyes kind of glazed over as they talked all about these scientific things that I didn't know anything about. Well, to some people, when you're talking about God, if you don't have any interest in, you haven't studied it something, it just sounds like a bunch of gobbledygook. Well, Jesus understood that. You have to be a seeker. You have to be in the right place for God to reveal his mysteries and secrets to, for you to really understand them. You have to be ready before that can happen. Not everybody's ready. And that's what he said through his illustration in his story. Um, and uh, then he kind of gave a kind of proverbial uh, thought on this too. Uh, for the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. I call that uh, a lesson in capitalism. <laughs> you think what happens in capitalism, if somebody comes along with a, a product and they work really hard, they have a business and they come in and work real hard and become very good at it. And everybody says, boy, this person's got the deal. We want to do business with them. And so uh, when they do, this person, you know, grows and grows. But on the other hand, their competitors who are not able to present as good a product, what little they have ends up getting taken away from them. Did you know that uh, about uh, six out of eight small businesses that start die in the first five years? They just don't make it. They'll make it past the first few years of existence, much less going on to be a successful business. And so I think uh, Jesus is applying this same thing. It may not seem fair because that's, you know, that's where we like to see it. It's not fair. Everybody doesn't get things equitably. Well, no, people don't get things equitably. Some people work harder than others. Some people are smarter than others. Some people are seekers of the kingdom of God. And they are going to learn an abundance of the will of God, while others, what little they know, may actually be taken from them. Uh, because some of the very religious people I've known that weren't very open and seekers as time went on, uh, they just became even less and less involved in what they were involved in. And uh, for example, uh, the pandemic kind of showed a lot. A lot of people were just in the habit of going to church. Pandemic stopped it. And some people just said, that was a bad habit. And I quit it and I'm not going back. And you discovered some of these people you thought were, well, they're a part of this. They attended, no, they're gone and they're not planning to come back. Well, that's what Jesus is saying here. You know, they didn't value what they had. So what little they had is going to get taken away. But on the other hand, if you're a disciple seeking, wanting to know, you're going to learn and experience an abundance. That's what the kingdom of God, just like the harvest is going to be uh, bountiful if you are open. God will make you fruitful in that regard. Um, let's go on to verse 13 through 15 back in chapter 13. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they, they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart in turn, and I will heal them. Bruce, how does this scripture relate to Jesus's audience? Well, again, remember the question is, why isn't everybody buying into this? If you're the real Messiah, shouldn't the uh, scribes and the Pharisees be acknowledging you? Shouldn't the religious leaders in, in Jerusalem be coming down and saying, this is the Messianic king, listen to him? 
why is it everybody's not buying in? Well, he said, think of the prophets. Uh, think of one of the most influential prophets in Israel was Isaiah. Did everybody buy in to the message God gave Isaiah? Well, let's go back. And uh, he quoted here from Isaiah 6. And I want to kind of go back to kind of get the, the context of Isaiah 6. First of all, I'll just say this appears to be when God called uh, Isaiah to be a prophet. Uh, and he was in the temple worshiping. Uh, and there appears to have been an earthquake of some kind. It shook the, and, and the sensors of the smoke began to fill the entire place. And, and Isaiah looked up and had a vision of the throne of God. And there was God. He saw him on the throne. And uh, Isaiah was overwhelmed with the vision he had of God. And then let's pick up with what took place then. So Isaiah 6, verse 5 through 7. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Yeah, so God does this profound symbolic action of seeing this seraphim, which is, you know, like a cherubim. These were guardians of sacred places that had wings and you know, you, you see pictures, stone images made of them guarding the temples of Egypt. Uh, here were living uh, guardians uh, coming down, getting some of the, again, this is where the altar was, getting some of the, the coals in the fire and coming and touching the lips uh, of Isaiah. What was Isaiah's concern? You know, I'm not a holy man. My, my lips have said a lot of things that are not clean. I, I'm not a pure agent you could speak through. Uh, I'm, I'm a sinful man. And so God says, I will atone for your sins. And I will forgive you. And then uh, with that in mind, let's look at what took place next, verse 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. And he said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their eyes heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and heal with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. And you know, it's a little different uh, translation here. The literally uh, Jesus quoted not from the Hebrew in that case, but quoted from the Greek translation of uh, this passage, so the Septuagint. So Jesus was willing to go to change from the Hebrew to a Greek text, which he knew they could be familiar with, when he thought there was something there that was relevant to the people he was saying and speaking to. So what is he saying here? God is telling Isaiah, I'm choosing you to be my spokesman. And so he says, who, who am I going to send to the courtroom of heaven? And Isaiah says, I've been cleansed. I volunteer. And so he said, go. And what? Uh, say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Seeing, but do not perceive. What? Uh, he's telling Isaiah that the people... They'll listen to what he has to say, but they're not going to get it. They're going to see and hear, but it's not going to result in understanding. Instead, by hearing the message over and over and not embracing it and living it, you're going to make the heart of the people dull. Their ears are going to be I'm heavy. That means they can't really hear anymore and blind their eyes. Now, if you tell somebody the truth enough times in a row, they'll eventually just, la, 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 la. They just kind of, I, I, I don't even hear you anymore. You know, 
I, I don't even want to hear you, so I don't hear you. Lest they see and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. So God is telling Isaiah, you're going to preach my message to the people. But instead of you having a great response, you're going to have a very negative response among most of the people. And they're not going to listen to you. Uh, they're going to become dull in their hearing rather than sharpened in their hearing and their attentiveness. And so he said, because if they would turn, if they really hear my message and repent, I would heal them just like I've healed you. But I'm telling you in advance, they're not going to. At least the overwhelming majority are not. And then going on with verse 11 through 12. Then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste, and the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Wow. In other words, how long am I going to preach these people and they're not going to be receptive? Until they're conquered by their enemies and carried off into exile. What? I mean, that'd be like telling a preacher, all right, here, here is your mission. I want you to go preach in this particular town, this group of people, and they're not going to listen to you. But don't worry. Over time, they'll all drift away. So eventually, there won't be anybody left. And then you'll have fulfilled your job. Well, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have volunteered for that. Perhaps Isaiah wouldn't have either if he'd known exactly what the mission was. But it wasn't a very encouraging mission. Uh, so if that's what happened in Isaiah's day, why do we think that suddenly, because God shows up and his word is in the mouth of his son, the Messiah, that all of a sudden the same crowd of people are suddenly all going to perk up, all of them are going to repent, everybody's going to decide to do the right thing. No, people are the same over time. And the majority of people uh, are not going to get gung-ho for God. That's unfortunately not the story. And so we have to be prepared for that. So Jesus was saying, he didn't say no one was going to, a little better off than Isaiah, right? A little better off because he said at least one of the soils was going to produce something productive. It's not like I want you to, you know, go out until there's no crops at all growing. Uh, that's basically what he told Isaiah. Uh, so at least Jesus is offering some hope uh, that some of the people, and of course, as you read on, it's not like that every one of the Jews responded, but thousands and thousands of them did over the beginning of the church and the ensuing year. So yes, many of them did, but not the majority of them, and not their primary leadership, Although a few here and there, like Saul, Paul, who was a leader among uh, the Jews, came around. But the point is that think back to the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, whatever prophets you choose, where did everybody listen? Where did everybody get gung-ho because the prophet spoke the word of God? Uh, and, of course, you won't find that to be the case. Uh, and if you did, it would be a very short-lived uh, event in the life, of, unfortunately, of the people of God. So with that in mind, let's go on back to Matthew 13, verse 16 and 17. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Who's why are Jesus' disciples especially blessed? Well, he's, he's telling them, you know, what the secrets of the kingdom of God that I'm revealing to you that have not been revealed before now are some of the greatest men of God of bygone eras, prophets and righteous people, uh, long to see. You know, God told them about a future, but it was still a little bit fuzzy. God 
promised to give the land to Abraham. And then Abraham said, well, this is an inhabited land. What do you mean you're giving this to me? Well, not yet. You're going, your people are going to have to go down to Egypt and then be enslaved. And then I'm going to set them free. And hundreds of years from now, I'm going to give them this land. Oh, so, but he didn't get to live to see it. That was what God told him was going to happen. And what God said would happen, happened. Uh, and so the prophets Isaiah and others, God had given them glimpses of the future, of the fullness of the rule of God in the lives of people, and how he intended not only to save his own people, the Israelites, but all the Gentiles as well. Uh, how God had a vision for everyone, not just the Jewish people. Uh, there were hints of that, but none of them, even though they they tried to perceive as well they could, none of them understood how that was going to happen. And now, in Jesus, they're going to get a glimpse of how all these promises of God are going to come together and going to work and fulfill all God's purposes. And when I think about this, remember the chapter 11 uh, in the book of Hebrews, which is uh, a chapter about the great uh, men and women of faith uh, in Israel. Uh, at the very last verses of chapter 11 of Hebrews, verse 39 and 40, it says something I think we ought to hear. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. So these great people of faith throughout the old covenant and before did not receive all that God had promised, since God provided something better for us and that they're not going to be completed or perfected apart from us. But now with us, they're going to become a part of God's forever family that he's creating through his son Jesus that will include all peoples of the earth. So uh, Jesus is saying, you know, not everybody's ready. And you can imagine, uh, think of this, the average Jew of Jesus' day spent their life learning to only eat certain foods, which meant you could never eat with a Gentile. So you really had nothing to do on, on a close relationship. You might sell a Gentile something or work for Gentile for a while. But you didn't eat with them. You didn't have social contact with them. And Jesus was going to say, the kosher laws are done with. I want you to eat with the Gentile. That was going to be a big barrier. So if you're not buying into the Jesus story as a Jew, you're definitely not going to buy into that. And so Jesus had to get the Jews prepared because some things are going to have to change for the kingdom of God to reign. And so he says, God has prepared something better uh, for us. And so uh, with that in mind, let's go back uh, to our text and uh, read verses 18 and 19 back in chapter 13. Here then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. Bruce, what is the meaning of this parable? So here Jesus says, all right, I'll explain what I was telling when I told the parable. This is the meaning of this parable for you. And it's what is it about? It's about the word of the kingdom. What kind of kingdom? God's rule. You know, God's promised rule that he will have a righteous king that will rule forever on his throne and that he will have a people who will exhibit the reign of God, that they will do the will of God in their lives. Um, so he says, this is about the word of the kingdom of God. And we know clearly this is the seed. Um, he says, well, when the seed was thrown and hit the hard path, uh, it, couldn't, it couldn't get any root. So what happens, he said, just like the birds of the air came and ate that. So he says, they don't understand uh, the message. And the evil one 
uh, comes and takes it away. You know, sometimes I think we underestimate uh, how God is working in the world, but on the flip side, Satan's busy and working in the world too. He's busy getting disciples of Satan. He's busy fooling and deceiving people. So if they do get exposed to the good news message of God, they don't see it as good news. Are they so combobulated with other kinds of philosophies and prejudices and ideas that they can't hear the good news message of God? And so some people, unfortunately, are like people on the path. It just, you know, the word comes to them, but they never absorb it, never comprehend it, and it gets stolen away from them. And I think Paul was talking about the same sort of thing uh, when he said in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verses 3 uh, through 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So what is the evil one doing? He is blinding. He's like he's putting a veil over their eyes so they can't see uh, clearly. So they can't see that Jesus Christ is God and that he is the true representation of the image of God in which we were all created and meant to be. He is the living embodiment of that. But they're going to, Satan's going to try. And in our day, I mean, I just think of all the uh, secular propaganda, you know, uh, you know, people are concerned about saving the planet and saving the whales and this and that, and they're as lost as they can be. You're not going to save the planet if you're a lost soul. And yet they don't even have any idea that they're spiritually and morally lost. Uh, I remember studying the Bible a few years ago here with a, a young woman and she was from, a, from another country and stayed here a while and then moved back to that country. And she said, oh, I kind of, where I grew up, I thought of myself as not religious or Christian, but I thought of myself as a spiritual person. That's kind of the latest thing. Well, what does that mean? Well, whatever you want it to mean, you have vague feelings about the, there's some higher power or something going on in the world, but you're open to every kind of manipulation. And Satan wants the world to be into all kinds of vague forms of spirituality. He just doesn't want them to come in contact with the living spirit of God. That's the only true spirituality. So as long as you're into something spiritual that has nothing to do with the spirit of God, Satan is very happy with your involvement. And he is blinding you with all this fake spirituality from being able to see the truth about your life and about what you really need. And so whether it was the first century or the 21st century, there's a lot of deceitfulness and Satan's working in all this. He's trying to sell the culture. The latest thing I see and I find entertaining, um, they've decided that they can't claim that everything miraculous that happened in the Bible didn't happen. Uh, so uh, they've now decided that all these miraculous things are aliens that came down from other planets. And all this is uh, the visitation they thought of the gods. All that was uh, aliens from other planets. So now they're explaining everything away. That's the latest uh, thing that everybody's by. I turn on the History Channel, and what I see is um, uh, mythology. Uh, mythology of these alien creatures that no one's seen, no one knows, but they're all over everywhere. They happen throughout history. All the Bible events, Jesus was right. One of those aliens, he had divine healing power. So they're they're trying to explain away all these things with a what a scientific worldview might believe that aliens from another place, more advanced, might have come here in the past. And so they're going to explain away everything. And yet here's the one problem. There's not any tangible evidence of that. It's all speculation, all speculation. Um, but my point is people are deceived and blinded by Satan. And uh, we need to be aware of what's going on and do what we can to try to help enlighten people 
so they can find their way in a dark place. That's the, the first one. Let's go back, look at verse 20 and 21. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises or account of the word or on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. Bruce, uh, what is the meaning or what about, what is it about this second soil? Well, we look at, uh, as Jesus explains it, you know, the rocky soil, well, that's people. And haven't we all run into people like that? You you come across somebody and and they're all, they're all excited. They just kind of discovered Jesus and, oh, oh wow. You know, they really want to do everything. And they, they rush in to be baptized. They rush into this, that. And then, you know, three or four weeks later, something doesn't work out for them in their life. And just as quickly as they embraced the whole Jesus story and jumped on board, ah, not interesting more. They don't return your phone call. They don't come back anymore. They just fall away immediately. Or the first time something gets hard, uh, they drop out. Um, we've all known people like that. Uh, and that's, again, another category of people that seem to be, and just like in the masses in Jesus' day, they were astonished and, wow, look at this Jesus. But nah, over time, they fell away. They didn't follow through. So some people fall away. Others follow through. And then the next one is perhaps the, the one that uh, unfortunately we've all seen, and that's people who endure for a little while, but it's the thorns uh, that take them out. It's the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. Choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Uh, I think about a person that... Uh, moved here years ago and uh, was uh, a banker and commuted into New York uh, as head of the bank. And, oh, he came in. And remember, he came with a house. And, oh, he was so lovey-dovey with his wife. Oh, they were such a couple. And they had been real active in the church back in Tennessee. And now they're here. And they were so excited to be here. And the next thing I know, uh, he's got him a girlfriend and he's living in New York and she can't believe this is happening to her and uh, their whole marriage crashes and burns. Um, as long as you kept them in this little small town, Tennessee, everybody goes to church environment, it worked. But the minute you put him in an environment of temptation where he suddenly had to have moral backbone and character, he had that. And he gave in and just became a victim of his own lust. Um, how many people we know like that? Steepfulness of riches in his case. That's what got him. I mean, he would commute every day an hour and a half back and forth. He got tired of that and he got a girlfriend and it all ended. And um, of course, we, I don't know how his story ended. I don't expect that ended well for him. Um, I did have kept contact with his spouse who moved uh, not too long after that. But I just think of all those stories of people who seemed like they were legitimate, you know, devoted disciples, had been for a number of years. They were not a young couple. They were probably in their mid-40s, early 50s, and had lived quite a while. And then all of a sudden, it was a train wreck. Um, it's so sad. The spiritual life gets choked out by some care of this world or some deceitfulness about how they're going to become wealthy. That's sad. You've done people like that. So have I. And Jesus said, that's the unfortunate truth. Let's look at how James put it in uh, James uh, chapter 1, verse 21. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Uh, put away all filthiness. Uh, that's earwax. 
built in this, you know how earwax can build up in your ear, and if it builds up enough, you eventually can't hear. You think you're losing your hearing. You're not losing your hearing. You've just got the earwax that's built up. And what happens when it does, you can't hear. And so he said, we have to do away with wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. And, it, and if your life, if your life is to be full of wickedness, it will make it where you can't hear the word. Therefore, the word can't get implanted. And therefore, this word of God that God wants to implant within you to save you can't save you because it can't penetrate the hardness of sin that you've allowed into your life. So I think that's James trying to warn Christians to uh, keep their meekness, not allow wickedness to have its role in their life and repent and turn to God so that they could be blessed by God as God wants uh, to bless uh, every one of us. And then finally, let's read the last couple of verses, verses uh, 22 through 23, and we'll wrap up with this song. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and deceitfulness of riches choke the word and proves, proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, in another, 60, and in another, 30. Bruce, what about these final responses? Uh, notice, just like there are three rejection soils, there are three different forms of fruitfulness. And he doesn't say, he's not making, I think, a criticism uh, of the summer, 30 or 60 or 100. He's just saying, you know, that's where the soil is. That's what that soil can produce. Uh, but it produces what it can. Uh, that's what's important, that we are fruitful. That's what God wants us to be. Uh, he wants us to be fruitful spiritually with our lives. Well, what in the world does that mean? Well, let's look at one key, I think. I remember we talked about true spirituality has to do with the spirit of God. Well, Galatians 5 Verse 22 and 23 tells us a lot about what it means to be fruitful. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, so Christ-like, godly characteristics, agape love, joy. You know, something that's beyond happiness, doesn't matter what your circumstances are, you can be filled with joy, um, peace, the shalom of God, um, and that we're patient. You know, if you're not patient, you're not going to see good things happen. Kindness is highly underrated, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. The Greek's word for education, self-control. Hmm. Think about that. If you don't have self-control, even though you know what you should do, you won't do it. You see some of these uh, professional uh, athletes that lose their cool in a game and become undisciplined and cause uh, you know, for their team to have a penalty. Went quiet because they're not disciplined. They're not self-disciplined. Uh, they're driven by too much passion and emotion, not enough self-discipline. And they can actually cost their entire team the game because of such undisciplined behavior. You know, self-discipline is highly underrated. You can have people that are not as smart, people that are not as capable, but who approach things in a disciplined way will get a lot further than some of the people that are much smarter, much brighter, uh, but have no self-discipline. Uh, we've all known people like that, haven't we? Um, so this is evidence the Spirit of God is working in us. So to be fruitful, God wants to produce in us Christ-like characteristics, which attracts people that 
that in any way sense that there's goodness in this world and that there may be a God, they're going to be attracted to people that even though they don't understand what it is that attracts them, there's going to be this attraction to a godly character. And then fruitfulness also in the scripture has to do with the growth of uh, congregations of God's people. So when God's people are filled with the fruit of the spirit, they're the proper people to take the message out and to bring people in. Uh, if you're not full of the spirit, you're not living those things, you can talk the talk and you can try to be evangelistic, but unless people see it in your life, no, nobody wants what, you, what you've got unless what you've got is better than what they have. And so the Spirit of God can produce that quality of life in us that God wants to produce. And so, of course, this whole parable of Jesus has been about sowing the seed, and it's clear that the seed is a message of the kingdom or the Word of God. So with that in mind, let's wrap up our thoughts tonight by looking at what Peter said no doubt thinking about what Jesus taught. First Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Uh -oh. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So the word that Isaiah 40 was alluding to, uh, flesh, he will flesh it like the grass, the glory. You know, it rains a little bit, the grass gets green, and then it dies. Grass withers, the flower fails. The word of the Lord is the only thing that remains forever. And that word is the gospel, the good news message of Jesus. And it's the power of God that produces a new birth in us, born of water and the spirit into a new life. So you can't be born again, as some people think of it, unless it's the seed that is the gospel, that is the word of God, that is the source of that. If it's a human word, it's not going to produce the same thing. It's only the word of God that endures forever. And that's why we take our time and we study the word of God because the truths that are in the word of God are enduring truths. Uh, how many books do you know that people read today that were read in the first century? I actually have a couple of them I've read. Josephus, you read Josephus? Probably not, but I read Josephus. He was written near the end of the first century. I've read a couple of... Uh, uh, Greek philosophers, Roman philosophers. We have, we have a few of them. And, you know, they have some things interesting to say, interesting enough that people make copies of them, and etc. But I'm telling you, not much. There was a lot said and a lot written that nobody thought worthwhile to make a copy of. But the Bible had such a profound influence. We have thousands and thousands of copies, even in the early years uh, of the Bible spread everywhere, all over the world. Why? Because it endures, because it's the truth. It's not just a part of the truth. It tells us the ultimate truth. It tells us about who we are, that we are originally made the image of God, that we have corrupted that image, that we have fallen away from God. And we're in need of being redeemed and to brought back. And then we find out that only God could do this. And he did in Jesus. And that now we can have new life, which was the life God intended to give us from the beginning that sin and rebellion robbed us of. And that God wants to restore that life to us, the life of Jesus, the life of God. He wants that to be our life. And he wants to give us immortality. Well, if you've got a better offer than that, I'd be glad to hear from you. Uh, but I don't think you're going to come up with anything better than that. And what's even better than the offer that God is giving is it's true. 
it's true. May we have the courage of our convictions to live this truth, to be fruitful followers of Jesus, and to make the most of the lives we have left to live to his praise and honor and glory. I pray we will. John, would you close us out with a prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you for your many wonderful blessings, for your son Jesus in whom we live and have our existence, for the comfort and guidance of your Holy Spirit, for eternal life and redemption and citizenship in your forever family through our obedience unto uh, Jesus and his gospel. And Father, we thank you that uh, you've allowed your servant Bruce uh, to be with us, to teach so clearly your word that we might uh, ingest it and absorb it and allow it to truly engraft to our hearts as the word which is able to save our souls. We pray, Lord, that we allow your word to transform us, to develop us, to grow us, and that we remain open to hear the truth in your word, even when it challenges challenges our traditions, that it is by your truth that we will be saved and not man's traditions. Father, we thank you that uh, we have a family to pray for us and we ask your prayers for those who are in need of your love and care as only you can provide it for those who are in need of healing and comfort, uh, of bereaving, those who are in harm's way, those who are in need of the basic provisions of life that we may take for granted. Father, let us be uh, representatives of you and be giving to those who are in need of those basic provisions. And Father, to uh, build one another up where we're torn down and to be encouragers rather than those who would break uh, our brother and sister. Father, we, you've given us such a responsibility to uphold your truth, to be loving to all men, and though we may even have some conflict with them, you would put us in position to demonstrate kindness, to win their hearts and win their souls for your glory. Father, we thank you that we have this family at the Princeton Church of Christ. And Father, we pray your continuous blessings upon us that we might grow our congregation uh, again to your praise and your glory, that you will see our church as pleasing and acceptable to you. Continue to bless us all who profess the name of Jesus, in his holy name, his prayers asked. Amen.